Hey everybody, we are now going to chapter two of Copper Sun. And uh, chapter two, still from part one to Mari's perspective, Strangers and Death. The strangers whom Bessa has spoken of arrived about an hour later. Everyone in the village came out of their houses to see the astonishing sight. Pale, unhealthy looking men who carried large bundles and unusual looking sticks as they marched into the center of the village. In spite of the welcoming greetings and looks of excitement on the faces of the villagers, the strangers did not smile. They smelled of danger, Mari thought, as one of them looked at her. He had, the, he had eyes the color of the sky. She shuddered. Again, this is more foreshadowing. Um, think about what you think the sticks are, the usual looking sticks. And remember, this is a village that um, hasn't seen uh, some of these things before. So this is very new to them. However, the unusual looking men were accompanied by warriors from the Ashanti tribe, men of her own land, men her people had known and traded with. So even if the village elders were concerned, it would be unacceptable now uh, not to show hospitality. Surely the Ashanti would explain, but good manners came first. Any occasion for visitors was a cause for excitement. So after the initial amazement and curiosity at the strange men, the village bubbled with anticipation as preparations were made for a formal welcoming ceremony. Mari stayed in the shadows, watching it all, uneasy, but not sure why. Their chief, or Awa, Awa Mifia, who could be spoken to only through a member of the Council of Elders, invited the guests to sit, and they were formally welcomed with wine and prayers. The chief and the Council of Elders, made up of both men and women, were always chosen for their wisdom and made all the important decisions. Mari was proud that her father, Kamala, was one of the elders, he was also the village storyteller, and she loved to watch the expressions on his face as he acted out the stories she had heard since childhood. We welcome you, the chief began. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. May you be protected from evil and may you live to a ripe old age. If you come in peace, we receive you in peace. Heroism is the dignity of our ancestors and in their name we welcome you. He passed the wine, made from palm tree leaves, to Amari's father, then to the other elders, and finally to the strangers. The men were skinned like the milk of goats, and their Ashanti companions drank the palm wine from hand-carved gourds that had been decorated with ceremonial tribal designs. The newcomers then offered gifts to the chief, small ropes of sparkling beads, unlike anything Amari had ever seen, casks of wine and lengths of fine cloth, so shiny and smooth that Amari marveled. She knew no human could have woven it. No real explanations for their presence had been given yet, but with the exchange of gifts, the feeling of unease began to lessen, and everyone knew that the dancing and drumming will soon begin. Ceremony was important. Business matters always follow proper celebration. It was not yet the time for questions. First came the stories, Amari might herself, starting to feel excited. As chief storyteller, Amari's father was highly respected. Kamala knew every story. Every proverb, every bit of tribal history ever told or sung or drawn by her people. He spoke at each birth, funeral, and wedding, as well as at unexpected special occasions like this. Villagers crowded around him in anticipation, although even the youngest child knew uh, by heart every story he would tell. The stranger sat politely and waited. Now, uh, just to um, pause for a minute, the uh, a lot of tribes or people in different countries, uh, they would tell stories. Uh, they may not write things down on books, but that was part of their culture um, to cultivate and bring together the tribe and the families. A lot of times uh, telling stories was a form of entertainment. And um, it was usually looked at as very fun, fun time, brought the family together and people would know the stories like you would be told the story over and over and over, over again. Um, and this happened like long time ago, back in ancient times too. Uh, so for example, like the Odyssey and the Iliad, those stories in Greek mythology um, before they were written down, they were just told verbally over and over and over again until someone finally wrote them down. Uh, so the same thing happened in these African tribes where um, it was a huge event to start having stories told. Okay. Let me tell you of the wickedness of Chief Agokoli, her father began. He was a wicked, wicked man. Wicked, the people responded with enthusiasm. He would give the UA people impossible jobs like weaving baskets out of sand. Impossible, the villagers responded almost in unison. The Yui people finally found a means to escape from the wicked ruler, Kamala recounted. The people crept out through a hole in the wall and fooled the soldiers of Chief Agokoli. And how did they do that? 
he asked the crowd, who of course knew the, the question was coming, as well as the answer. They walked backward in the dirt, the people responded enthusiastically. And so they did, Kamala said, ending his cell with a tapping on his drum. They walked backward on the dirt so their footprints looked like the prints of someone arriving into the village, not departing. He looked at Amari as he finished the tale with the wink he saved for her alone. Everyone in the small community, including Amari, laughed and clapped their hands at the familiar story. Amari loved her father's stories, and the sound of his deep, gravelly voice had always made her feel safe. Whether he was whispering silly noises in her ear, speaking formally in a meeting of the elders, or chatting with affection with her mother. To the family's great amusement, Kamala was sometimes seen to him in their small hut after the evening wheel. <laughs> you sound like a monkey in pain, Amari's mother would tell her husband fondly. But when he was telling stories, his voice was magical. Amari could listen to him all night. The feeling of tension faded. The drummy would come next, and after the storytelling, this was Amari's favorite part of her village's celebration. Amari looked around for Bessa. He was the assistant to the village master, Arts Man, the one responsible for the creation of all the dances and drum rhythms. She knew Bessa would be anxious to show off his skill on the drum he had carved and painted himself. Amari was proud of how devoted Bessa was to learning the rhythms. He told her once, You know, Amari, the drums are not just noise. They are language. They are the pattern of the rhythm of our lives. He had no need to look at his hands to produce the drum sounds that live within him. She loved to watch Bessa stare into space, smiling as he drummed, lost in the rhythms he created. As soon as the master's, a master drummer started playing, everyone in her village felt the call. The younger boys, whose fingers itched to show their skills, grabbed their own small drums and joined the beat. Villagers began to get up and move to the rhythms. Bessa played with the confidence and skill he always did. Amari's eyes were on only him. Her heart beat faster as Bessa's fingers caressed the sounds out of his skin drum, uh, skin cover drum. And remember, this is you'll see and notice as we continue to read, like just just the love that Amari has for her culture, for her people, for her village, um, how close knit her family was. This is just like any other family. Like she loved her mom, she loved her dad, she loved her brother, her friends. This is very close knit. Um, so you know, keep that in the back of your mind as we continue to read this chapter. Drum beats echoed in the approaching darkness. The fire in the center of the assembly air glowed on the faces of the dancers, mostly younger children and women at first, but soon nearly everyone in the village joined in. Even the old ones, whose toothless grins spoke their happiness. All spoke to the spirits with their joyous movements. Their bodies swayed, their hands clapped, their feet stomped in a glorious frenzy, all to the rhythm of the drums. Baba laba do ga we do. The words or sounds are words from deep within, from a place that was lost now found. So bo he we do so ma da ma da so so. Sound itself is you as we sound is past is now is so. So bo he we do so ma da ma da so so. From remembered past to forgotten tomorrow, drum talk throbs, breathes, life speaks, sing songs, words. Ba ba la ba do, ga we do. Warriors pulse, maidens sway, elders, children rejoice. Thrum to the heartbeat, thrum to the heartbeat. Ba ba la ba 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 la ba ga we do. Kwasi, as round and brown as a as a cola nut, danced with the rest of the children, gleefully spinning in the dust. Amari watched him and remembered how he once had captured a small bird and copied his movements, flapping his arms like wings, telling her with much laughter that he intended to learn how to fly. And as Kwasi stomped and glided through the dust that evening, it seemed to Amari that he really was flying. He ran over to Amari then, breathing hard with excitement. Come, he said, grasping her arm and trying to pull her into the dancing. Why are you hiding in the shadows? Come, dance for the strangers. She pushed Kwasi away gently, reminding him she was no longer a child. She was to be married soon, and she preferred peeking at Bessa, who stood behind his wayside drum on the other side of the fire, watching her as well. The drum beats rippled in the darkness. The dancers swayed and stomped on the hard-packed earth, and Amari's people clapped and laughed as the firelight glimmered in the night. The first explosion came from the end of one of the unusual weapon sticks the strangers carried. Louder than any beat of even the largest drum, it was followed by a cry of horror. The chief had fallen off his seat, a huge red bleeding hole in the center of his chest. More explosions followed in rapid succession. Then everyone was screaming. Confusion and dust swirled throughout the village. Amari watched, aghast, as a mother with her baby wrapped on her back tried to flee. But both mother and child were clubbed down into the dirt by one of the Ashanti warriors. And Ashanti? How could this be? Villagers ran blindly into the fire, trying to escape and screaming for mercy, only to be failed by the terrible fire weapons of the strangely pale men. 
Mari knew she should run. She knew she should try to escape into the forest, but her feet would not move. She could only stare in horror. She gasped as she watched an Ashanti grab her mother and try to put thick iron cuffs on her mother's wrist. She turned her head and followed, in slow motion it seemed, her father's, her father's bellows of rage as he leaped toward her mother to rescue her. Before he even reached her, one of the milk-faced men thrust a knife into his stomach, and Kamala fell silent to the earth. Amari's mother screamed in anguish and bit her captor's hand. In rage, he hurled her to the ground. Amari watched, unable to breathe or move, as her mother's head smashed upon a rock. Amari wanted to scream, Mother, get up! Oh, please get up! But she was unable to say a word. Her mother, her mother did not move. Amari needed her parents to come get her, to tell her not to be afraid, to run with her into the underbush for safety. But they just lay there, their blood beginning to stain the dust. Amari doubled over in agony. Her parents were dead. She looked frantically for Bessa and Kwasi, but all was smoke and screams and death. Finally, she saw Kwasi running toward her, screaming, Run, Amari, run! He, his, her feet loosened then as he reached her. She grabbed his hand and then ran wildly out of the village to what they hoped was the safety of the darkness. Sharp branches cut Amari's face as she plunged through a thick tangle of trees. The smell of sharp, acrid smoke, not of gentle hearth fires, but of the flames of destruction, followed them. Birds and monkeys above them cried out in alarm, but their noise could not cover the screams of the slaughter of her people. Suddenly, Amari heard fast moving, thudding footsteps behind them, and the whir of a spear. Kawasi held her hand tighter, and they ran even faster, Amari trying in vain to be as invisible as swift as the wind. Fly, my baby brother, she thought desperately. Fly away. One moment, they were leaping over a fallen log, and the next moment, she heard Kwasi moan softly. Then his hand slipped away from hers. He slumped to the ground, a, a look of soft surprise on his small face. A spear had sliced through his whole little body. Amari sank down beside him and held him to her. He died in her arms. She lay there in the darkness, cuddling his small, lifeless body, unable to weep, unable to run any longer. She hardly cared when she was grabbed by one of the strangers. Her arms were wrenched behind her, and iron shackles with heavy, rusty chains between them were snapped onto her wrist, holding them there. Amari was marched back to where the burning village had once stood so happily, grabbed by her hair, and shoved into a pile of other survivors from the village. No one spoke. No one wept. They were defeated. So, in chapter 2, um, you kind of see where it all kind of went south for them. Um, the strangers, uh, you guys probably already know what the strangers were. These are um, men looking for slaves uh, back in the 1700s. Uh, this story takes place in, I believe, 1734, around about. Um, and you can just kind of see the contrast of how happy Amari was before this with her family. And again, like I said before, all the love that she had and just kind of imagine, you know, all that love. And then a single night, you know, like that is just gone. You know, her parents, her mom, she had to watch her mother die, watch her father die um, and watch her brother die all violently. Her brother right beside her. Uh, she had to witness all of that friends dying. So uh, we'll be going on to chapter two. Um, or excuse me, chapter three in the next video. Take care. See you then.